Hello, my name is Christina Wilkins and I'm recording this presentation on the land of the Ogurupul and Kitabul First Nations peoples of Australia. This presentation is about the mechanical action of curb bits, like the ones in double bridles. And while double bridles consist of two bits, I'm going to be focusing only on the curb. I'm going to largely ignore the snaffle or the bradoon. First, to make sure you can follow my slides, let's look at the parts of the curb bit and bridle that are relevant to, the, to its action. On the left is a photo taken side on of the most basic waymouth bit, very commonly used with double bridles. The curb bit hangs from the top rings from the cheek pieces. The cheek pieces are attached to the headpiece, which goes over the horse's pole. The mouthpiece sits quite close to the top ring, just a little bit further down. And at the end of the shank is, are the rings where you attach the curb reins. And of course, you have the curb chain and curb hooks. A uh, curb bit is not a curb bit unless it has a uh, curb chain. And uh, then there's also this little D-strap, D-ring uh, for a lip strap. And it's used for attaching a thin leather strap that simply prevents the shanks flipping forward if the horse shakes the head, but it doesn't really interfere with its action. Now I've created a simpler diagram and I will explain in this presentation how they actually work because what we've been assuming and has been written about in books is not very clear. So in this presentation, I'm going to explain that all curb bits are very powerful second class levers and that with great power comes great responsibility. Here's a video to show the action using my leg. I know it's counterintuitive, but I've placed the curb chain on my bony shin because on the horse it wraps around the bony mandible and the, at the chin groove. This means the mouthpiece is sitting on the softer tissues of my calf because the mouthpiece sits on the horse's tongue and lower lips, which are soft tissues. And I think this is the fairest way to have a look at its action. Watch carefully uh, the top ring and the chain hook because they create a hinge as I pull on the shank. As the chain engages, the mouthpiece presses into my calf. And I can create the same effect with a fixed hand without pulling by changing the degree of knee flexion. In theory, if the hand is fixed, the horse can do the same by changing the angle of the head. Here's a different view. So you can see the soft tissues compressing and decompressing when I pull, when I pull the reins, just adjusting it here, you can see the calf muscles compressing and decompressing as I pull. And I can create the same effect again when I fix the hand and I change the degree of knee flexion, the angle of, um, of my leg relative to where the reins are. The curb bit is very effective and has been extremely popular throughout horsemanship because it creates a lot of compression uh, with little effort and because the horse can learn that flexing at the pole, tucking the nose in, might release the pressures they feel on the tongue, lips and mandible. Here's an illustration. When there is no rein tension, when the rider is not pulling or trying to keep a contact and the horse's head is still, the curb shank will line up with the headpiece and the curb chain will be slack. When you apply rein tension or when the horse applies it for himself by pushing the nose forward, the curb shank and the mouthpiece swing cordially. They move closer to the rider and the curb chain comes into tension. Now a lot is said about the curb applying downward pressure on the pole, but a couple of studies have found that it is not significant. And if you try my leg experiment for yourself, you will agree with the findings. There is a slight increase of tension, but it stops increasing as soon as the chain engages because it fixes the position of the top ring, which then becomes the hinge. Here we have it again. And remember that this is assuming the rider is doing the minimum. 
just letting the horse come against the curb pressure when they poke the nose forward and find a release for themselves when they tuck the nose in. So as long as the rider doesn't pull further, the horse will not feel additional pressure from the curb provided they maintain the flexed neck posture that's being imposed by the rider through just the length of the reins and the position of the hand. Now, if the rider picks up the contact and engages the curb chain when the horse is already flexing at the pole and already has the nose line at the vertical, the horse is going to inevitably try to find a release of the pressures by flexing deeper or overbending. This is hyperflexion or roll curve and it has become a real problem in many disciplines with many trainers and riders saying it contravenes all the traditional knowledge of achieving collection and correct biomechanics while researchers and veterinarians are warning of a host of welfare problems. Again, when the rider tries to maintain a contact however light it feels to the rider, the horse will overbend or try to overbend to relieve the compression on the tongue, lips and bars. The next problem for the horse is if when they're already overbent, the rider does not release the curb because they continue pulling or the, the hand keeps going backwards. And we have evidence this is happening in sports, meaning that however much the horse shortens and flexes the neck, they still are not getting clear releases of the curb. So I'm going to show why it is so important that riders do not use the curb reins to maintain a contact. In other words, riders should not try to ride the horse into the curb contact. You might be able to keep a contact with a snaffle mouthpiece and this is why double bridles also have a snaffle. But you should not be keeping any contact higher than the weight of the curb reins when the horse is already flexing at the pole. Why? Because the curb is a powerful lever and it is very easy for the rider to underestimate the amount of force the horse is receiving. Very easy to put more pressure than the tissues can actually cope with. So let's go back to the mechanical action of the curb. First, let's check the moving parts again. Watch how the chain fixes at the front of my leg and how the shank hinges at the top ring when I pull on the reins. The fact that the hinge is at the very top of the lever makes the curb bit a second class or second grade lever. And levers have a mechanical advantage, meaning they amplify the effort that we put in. Let's explain. The typical example of a second class lever should be very familiar to horse people. It's the wheelbarrow. In a wheelbarrow, the fulcrum is the wheel. The load sits close to the fulcrum and the long handles are the levers that make it easier to lift the heavy load. And by fulcrum, I mean the hinge. So I might be using fulcrum and hinge um, interchangeably throughout this presentation. This, however, is not the best type of lever to explain the curb action. The curb action is actually a second class lever of the nutcracker or lemon squeezer type. This is because in a nutcracker, the load is also located between the fulcrum, the hinge and the effort. And here is the lemon squeezer version. Levers always offer a mechanical advantage. That's what they're for, to make our work easier. So let's have a look at just how much advantage they offer. To calculate the mechanical advantage of a second class lever, you need to know the length of the longer input arm and you simply divide it by the shorter output arm. In the basic weighmouth bit that I have, the input arm is 10 centimeters long and the output arm is two and a half centimeters long. 
That means this simple curve bit gives the rider a mechanical advantage of four. For every unit of force you apply when you pull on the reins, the lever arm will multiply by four the force at the level of the mouthpiece. If you don't believe me about the mechanical advantage of four, you are not alone because I didn't believe myself. So I decided I needed to double and triple check my theory. I consulted others who know more about mechanical levers and a special thank you to Jake for helping me out. And I built a rough but functional frame that allowed the curb and the chain to hinge. I then used two digital scales in opposite directions. One was attached to the mouthpiece and the other one was attached to the reins. And I compared the, the tensions measured. I pulled the reins with up to 10 Newton and hey presto, I consistently got very close to 40 Newton on the mouthpiece force gauge. My test consistently confirmed a mechanical advantage of approximately four and therefore supports the second class lever hypothesis. So there you have it. The curb bit is a second class lever of the nutcracker or lemon squeezer type. Basically it is designed to squeeze the tongue and lips and bars very efficiently. For every unit of force the rider applies to the reins, the mouthpiece load is four times greater. And unfortunately, the lever effect makes riders think that with the curb, they're riding more softly and that this must be a great thing for the horse, but you have to account for the physics. You have to make yourself remember that at the level of the mouthpiece, the load is being placed on sensitive structures and the force is four times greater. Nevertheless, it is important to remember that rein tension is not the same as pressure, as in the pressure applied by the mouthpiece on the sensitive tissues or the compression being felt by those tissues. In order to make an, estimate, an, an estimation of pressure, you need to know the rein tension and the area of contact of the, of the mouthpiece on those tissues. So this is the area of my leg that I'm pointing to with an arrow. You would need to just estimate the, uh, yeah, just the dimensions of that area. Of course, this is my leg. It is not the same shape as the horse's mouth, the tongue, the lips, the bars. As you can imagine, it is tricky to estimate the contact area inside the horse's mouth. And I haven't attempted to do this, to take this measurement or, and therefore I cannot do the calculation. But I, I think it's now time to go to the real world to see what curbs can do to real tongues, to real lips, to real um, bars. Bear in mind that the horse's tongue occupies the entire cavity. There is no room for one, let alone two mouthpieces in there. This is a great composite image of a horse wearing a double bridle by Torbjorn Lundström. Check out the tongue's outline. And here is my graphic interpre interpretation of the same, but with labels. You can see that even without picking up the rein, the tongue is already deformed by the presence of the mouthpieces. This will should um, help you get an idea of just how easy it is for the tongue to become trapped and severely compressed between the curb's mouthpiece and the bars with little rider effort. With the help of technology such as very high quality cameras, we are seeing lots of examples of extremely deformed, sometimes the tongues, sometimes turning blue or dark purple, and sometimes even lacerated. Horses in double bridles should not be ridden with such high rein tensions on the curb reins. They should be mostly in self-carriage, that is with no more tension on the curb than the weight of the reins. But unfortunately, this is not the case, even at the highest levels, or perhaps especially at the highest levels, when precision and impulsion are so well rewarded by the judges, and also because riders are determined to make horses 
uh, bend and over flex and very controlled with very extravagant paces and they end up with very short compressed necks. When you see the photographic evidence from current FEI competitions, for example, the collections of excellent quality sequences of multiple images by fine art photographer Crispin Parelius Johannesson, you are likely to see that regardless whether the horse has the nose line on the vertical or they go behind the vertical, the tension is really high. The horses are not able to find a release of the curb pressure. They're not in self-carriage, but the neck is already as it at its maximum flexion and the horses have nowhere to go to find a release from the compression of the curb. And for those who still think these images represent only a moment in time, here is a whole sequence, two almost complete canter strides. These photos show an elite rider not using the curb fairly, not releasing at all, despite the changing degrees of flexion at the pole. Now you might see that the curb rein on the right closest to us becomes loose for a few moments but because the rider is still pulling on the left rein the curb chain is not releasing either the reins go together so consider the welfare risk because if you take the horse's perspective the risk is considerable simply because the rider gets very unreliable feedback. The rider's perception is that they are being very gentle, riding with a light contact, while to the horse, those forces are multiplied by four. Yes, horses are also likely to respond quicker to your rein aids compared to the snaffle. But remember, this is because of the pain or the threat of pain and the lack of control the horse has over the pressures being applied. After all, you would be paying attention too if your tissues were held within a nutcracker and someone else was in control of the levers. So in summary, the curb is specifically designed to compress sensitive tissues of the horse's head. And as a second class lever, it gives rider the sense they are not pulling much while the lever amplifies the force at the mouthpiece level. So if there's one thing I hope you take away from this video is that curbs are very powerful. And as Batman said, with great power comes great responsibility.